welcome to the MIME Radio Show. I'm Karen Hoyer. And I'm James Donlan. And here we are, Karen, in season four. It's been quite a journey for us. <clears throat> Today we have a very fascinating and very interesting and creative, talented guest. But before we do that, let me mention the man behind the black field on the other side of our uh, images, Michael Diaz, our producer. And we all know if we make a mistake, he'll save us. And if we do something that's a little insulting to him, he'll take us off the air. So we're we indebted better, to him. For, we better for behave. Day. We better behave, James. That's right. <laughs> Tell us about our guest. All right. <clears throat> Today, we have a very talented man, one of the, um, the uh, how should I say, the foundations of mime, in the, particularly in the Decrue technique, Thomas Lebhart. Let me tell you something about him. Tom Lebhart is recognized as one of the world's foremost authorities and practitioners of their crew technique. After growing up in Pennsylvania, Amish country and Florida, graduating from college, Tom received a Fulbright grant to study with Etienne de Crew in Paris for one year. However, for three more years, he continued working as the crew's teaching assistant and translator, and eventually returned to the US to teach at various schools including the University of Arkansas, Ohio State University, and the influential Valley Studio in Spring Green, Wisconsin. Tom began teaching at Pomona College in 1982 and continued there for 40 years. At Pomona, he directed student actors, authored four books, founded, edited, and published 30 issues of Mind Journal, toured internationally to Europe, Latin America, and Asia with five one-person presentations, and taught Te Cru Technique in Europe and Latin America with Eugenio Barba's ISTA, the International School of Theater Anthropology. Tom hastened to add that none of this would have been possible without his wife of 51 years, Sally, whose invaluable work contributes to his theater pieces and publications in every aspect. So with that, let's welcome in Thomas Lebhart. Ta -da. Hello, hello, Tom. Hello, hello. Thanks for joining us. Tom, you've had such an amazing influence on the mime world. Um, and for my entire career, you've been one of the people that I've looked up to. So we're just really thrilled that you're here and that you can tell us a little bit about your experiences. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've known Tom. I wouldn't say we were friends. <laughs> but we've been in the same place at the same time. We were definitely acquaintances and part of the same tribe. But I first met Tom and saw his work in 1974 at the International Mime Festival in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And since that time, Tom has been a pillar of especially the, the, the crew technique. So, Tom, we always like to start by asking performers how they prepare. And I'm really interested in um, you letting us know what you do to prepare before a performance. Uh, what do you think about right before you go on stage? But also, since you've had such a long career as a teacher, how do you approach that with your students? How do you share with them a good way to prepare to go out on stage? So I think that um, we can teach a little bit of theater history at the same time that we're teaching performance skills. And I think of and tell students about Eleonora Duse, the 19th, late 19th, early 20th century uh, Italian actress, uh, who is a rival of Sarah Bernhardt. And a lot of people have heard of Sarah Bernhardt who haven't heard of Eleonora Duse. But she had a, quite a long and fascinating career that students like to hear about. And uh, she had a, a ritual before going on. She would meditate sometimes for as many as, uh, as long a time as hours. She would meditate on a theme, oh, let me be empty, let me be empty, let me be empty, was her thought. And this thought was kind of a, a wave or a kind of a crest that took her out onto the stage. Uh, and now jumping ahead to 1970, I'm a student at DeCruz School, teaching assistant and translator, as Jim pointed out. 
and we get a phone call from a French cultural center in one of those little town cities outside of Paris. Uh, and I don't know if it was Rennes. Uh, I've, I've forgotten. I've misplaced the name of the city. Uh, but we were to do a lecture demonstration. And I was to perform the carpenter. Mm -hmm. We're behind the stage, behind the curtain. And as the hour approaches, we begin to hear louder and louder murmuring and scuffling of feet and unwrapping of candy wrappers and so on on the other side of the curtain. And the crew came over to me and took me by the arm and walked me back and forth behind that closed curtain. And he said, not to worry, my boy, not to worry. You can perform very well or you can perform poorly. No <laughs> one will ever know the difference. They're imbeciles. They are all imbeciles. <laughs> uh, so there are these uh, different approaches, historical approaches, love the Katakali when for 24 hours before the performance starts, the person is allongé, the person is lying down, sort of all covered up in dirt as if dead, except the face is sticking out. And these wonderful, enormous crowns and uh, excroissance are made so that when it's time for the performance, the actor who is in a already in a state, a different state of mind, is helped to his feet and comes slowly up and is kind of reborn into a new place. Ah. So there are all of these different ways to look at those moments. And mm -hmm. I think that I do something depending on the day. Uh, something <laughs> between the Katakali and De Crew and Eleonora Duce. So, so oh. did, did De Crew really think that the audience was the relation? His concept of the audience was that they were imbeciles. And do you have that concept of the audience? That was my question. Like, what's yeah. your what? What does that body of humanity in front of the performer mean to you? I, I don't think the audience is an imbecile. There okay. are imbeciles. Um, you know, the thing about performing is that you get to try something out. And if it works, that's good. Thank you. And if it doesn't work, you can sort of go on to the next thing, the next version or the next iteration. So I I don't think I ever tried thinking that the audience really was, because I actually knew some people who were going to be in, in that audience at Ren, and I knew that they they were quite perceptive people. <laughs> um I like Eleanor Duce. Mm -hmm. I think that's so I, really I guess cool. we're talking about um, sort of a, a little bit about the the uh, dynamic between an audience and a performer, and um, knowing that your specialty is the crew, which we'll talk about a little later. Um, one of the the um, foundations of modern mime. I'm just wondering, from your perception, from your background as a the crew practitioner. How would the de crew person think of the audience in general? I mean, is there a fourth wall? There's a, is there not a fourth wall? Um, are they imbeciles? Are they not imbeciles? You know, because the master himself, Etienne de Crew, told you they were imbeciles. I'm just wondering what your thoughts would be in terms of that. It's a complicated question. Uh, I'll tell you what. If we could allow this wonderful, wonderfully complex question to hover in the air. <laughs> And if we could go forward, this happens a lot when I don't know the answer to a question. I tell the students, could we come back to this in 24 hours? Yeah. <laughs> when I've had a chance to think about, of course, we don't have 24 hours, but no. uh, we, we could come back to it in 24 minutes or we could come yeah. back to it sure. in a little bit. But I'm sure, you know, the crew every Friday night gave these wonderful lectures and he would launch out into the deep. He would start on this, and someone would ask him that, and he would go have all of these different things. And they were all, and he'd say, how is he ever going to make sense out of all of these uh, questions? And somehow, just about five minutes before the end of the hour, he'd reach up and pull all of these things down and weave them together. 
So <laughs> let's let's see if we can't be the crew, but maybe we can try the crew tip <laughs> trick and see if it'll work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's probably the best time now for you to tell us a little bit, especially for people that don't have any exposure to the crew technique. What is his system of technique? What is his philosophy? And and in a nutshell, if you can, of course, we will refer them to your many writings about him, but just a little bit of the essence of who the crew was and how he affected the theater world. Yeah, and how you were attracted to that. I mean, to get a Fulbright, to go to study with him, what attracted you to his style of performance or his magic, you know? Uh, in, the, in the 1960s, um, the big thing that everyone had on their mind was, how can we stay out of the war in Vietnam? Mm. And the only way that we knew how to do it, or thought very much about, was... Um, uh, there were unofficial ways, there were official ways to do it, but the the official way to do it would have been to stay in graduate school. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I went to graduate school at, at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. My undergraduate degree had been in visual arts. In mm -hmm. graduate school, I, stu I studied uh, theater, theater and dance. Uh, and I had a wonderful teacher from the Humphrey Weidman troupe by the name of Eleanor King. And Eleanor King had studied with the crew in a summer workshop. Uh, and there was a film available from Waco, Texas, from Baylor University in Waco, Texas. Really? And she somehow got her hands on this videotape, not videotape, but film, 16 millimeter film, and uh, showed it to the class. Uh, and she said, now, uh, I don't think this is a, that he's a very nice person, but I think that he somebody that you will read about in the history books and that that I should uh, that you should have a look at anyway. Uh, so she showed this film. I thought this was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen in my life. And I think my jaw must have dropped. I think my eyes glazed over. Uh, and we got to the end of the film. And I just knew that's what I was going to do. It was uh, uh, it was one of those what a coup de foudre, uh, struck by lightning. And you had um, never. It sounds like you didn't really hadn't done much performing for an audience in any way up to that point. If you say uh, visual I, art, so. I had I had yes, a visual arts, but then some dance also. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So I had I'd done a little bit of performing. But somehow there was something about De Cruz quality in this film. Now you can see the film very easily. If you look on the internet, uh, Etienne De Cruz uh, video, it's not a video, but I think the, you could write Google in Etienne De Cruz video, Waco, Texas, and it'll come up, or Baylor University. And all of that wonderful film, chopped up into bits because they were little segments. Now, yeah. I've, I've lost what, what your question was. Go, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, the, you, you we're talking about visual art. I know we're going to interview Leonard Pitt at some point who studied, of all things, advertising, graphic arts and advertising yeah. earlier. So I'm wondering if there there was a a sense of visual art in the crew technique or a sense of the of the geometry. You know, we've, we, we've all heard about this, of course, in terms of uh, the the base of the crew work, you know, the geometry of the space, the, the physics of the space in a visual sense, as well as an energy sense. So I'm thinking that you had a connection to that, you know, that drew you to his work in Paris. Yeah. Yeah. There's certainly a, a lot to be said for that. Ducru loved advertising art. He loved to see the posters in uh -huh. the new show and uh -huh. how the graphic artist was able to reduce a complex idea to a simple gesture, uh -huh. one simple yeah. gesture. Uh huh. Um, Surely, yeah. So I, I think there's a lot to be said there. There's a lot to be discovered in that. Mm. Uh, one of the difficulties, uh, this is a, maybe a joy and a little bit of sorrow too, about um, having reached a certain age, is that a, a question that before would have opened up. Um, two or three hours of <laughs> monologue. 
uh, now leads one instead to think, hmm, where to, where to, which string to start on? Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. But you also know that it's really much more complex than that. Yeah. It's, it's, in my memory, whenever decrue a practitioner or a performance or a, an article was addressed uh, or was representative of decrue, there was, always was um, feedback. We'll call it feed. I'll call it feedback or reaction. It seemed like whatever it was that he was doing, whether they were the students or the the you know an expert like yourself who learned the technique, that there was always energy that wanted to continue, you know, and people wanted to talk about it, whether it was, you know, everybody always had opinions about what the group yeah. meant and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the thing is that he meant different things on different days in different uh -huh. situations. And I think to try to pin him down is a mistake. And yeah. To try to say, this is what the crew thought. And th this is what he thought on which day. This yes. is what he thought. For example, he went for a very long time before I was his student, but for a very long time, when everything started on the ground, flat on your back on the ground, as if you were buried. Huh. And that was the beginning. And the, the whatever the exercise was, you had to make your way to your feet, up to your feet, and then began this whole process of doing something else. So mm -hmm. after, I don't know how many decades, maybe a decade and a half or two, two decades of starting everything on the ground, he said, well, enough of that. We tried that. Now the zero position is heels together, standing, arms mm -hmm. to the sides, and take it from there. So, And it's really interesting, too, because he had such a long career of teaching that there are many generations of people that studied and then went on to be teachers, and they each had a maybe a different experience with him as a teacher. Yeah. I'm I'm working now via Zoom with a small group of intermediate advanced Ducru students. Mm -hmm. And we're we're making a we're learning uh the washerwoman, which is a classic 1930s Ducru composition, which he revived several times thereafter after the 1930s, one time with me. Uh, and so we're learning this sequence, and it's kind of funny because we say, are we going to do the 1974 part there? And then we're going to go back to this other version there. And each student is kind of building his or her own structure, mm -hmm. uh, mm. but composed of different parts, which is the way he would work in rehearsal. We would begin the composition uh, off stage with a walk coming on, T head turn, body turn, first position, ta, and then we would begin shh, oh. and we would begin this composition. And we did that for months. And then he says, oh, no, we're not going to do the walk on anymore. We understand that. You've got, you're, you're there. It doesn't matter. Start in the middle. And the first moment is that. So there's a lot of ability to change, ability to redefine and re... Yes. I had a question. So now you just made a vocalization, a, a percussive vocalization in tandem with uh, your memory of the movement. Now I remember watching you teach 40 years ago and you had this melodic vocalization that would accompany some of the exercises you were teaching the class. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because when I perform, I hear percussion and percussion in my head too. And mm -hmm. almost like anime, like an animated film. There are these, you know, these sounds that happen. So I'm just wondering, and you did it there. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about why why that comes, how that musicality comes to this work of the crew. Was that an important part of his fabric, you know, this sense of mm -hmm. sound and music, you yeah. know, in terms of the, the movement and so forth? Mm -hmm. uh, he, he loved word origins, mm -hmm. and he spent half of every day on word origins, and he had dictionaries, and he had stacks of notes, and he had stacks of books, and and hunched over his desk with his quill pen and his ink, and writing lists and lists of words. And so he would take us back to the origin of words a lot of times, and he said, enchanté 
is enchanted means singing inside. Mm. And the whole idea, the gesture, ta, and how could that be colored? It be, could be colored with a talk at the beginning, or it could be colored with a talk at the end, shh, or it oh. could be colored with talks in the middle, shh. And you call them talks. Uh, T O C, what, yeah, I talk. Yeah, and that was his word. That was his uh, uh, yes. vocabulary to describe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the vibrato coming from muscular respirators, we've got biceps, pectorals, and buttocks, and we can start with a trembling in a certain part, and that trembling takes the gesture out, mm. and we get a kind of this vibrato which is carving on the retina of the spectator's eyes, we hope. That's very interesting. <laughs> and can, you describe, can you describe the atmosphere of a typical De Croo class, maybe from the time when you were a student? You know, could, it, like, can you give it the, the listeners an idea of what that would have been like to be in his class, you know, a typical day in the, in the well, student? What, was, what was so wonderful was that he, he taught, of course, in his own home, mm. in this little cottage in boulogne billancourt and this uh, little cottage at the back of the garden. And uh, the students would arrive uh, not more than five or eight minutes before class because the door would be not open, mm. but five minutes before, open the door and go in and take off your shoes and put them around the pot-bellied stove that was in the kitchen. And if Madame de Cru were there, she would be sitting at the at the table and she would mark you present, present. If she wasn't there, if she was, for example, out shopping, when she got back, she would take her roll sheet and she, by judging from the shoes, she would be able to know who was here. And she would mark the roll that way. So you arrived, took your shoes, left your shoes around the, the stove, went upstairs to the changing room. And the changing room was quite a small, that we're talking minuscule here. When you're talking about one of the great thinkers and doers of 20th century theater, you think of big state uh, supported studios and work, workplaces, but no, this was really where somebody lived and a person of extremely modest means lived. So we went up into this changing room, which I th often thought of it was like the, the United Nations. There was a <laughs> little group of Spaniards over there and a little and everybody changing clothes, hanging up their clothes, getting ready. And when you heard the bell, downstairs, through the kitchen, down another flight of stairs into the basement, cold, damp, basement, blue, bright blue. The bright blue. Yes, oh the, the floor was blue, the walls were blue, the ceiling was blue. The ceilings were quite low. Uh, Dean Fogel talks about uh, de Cruz mentioning that when they first moved to the house, uh, that he and Madame de Cruz went into the basement every day and spent a long time shovel, shoveling dirt into bags which every night, once it was dark, they would take these up onto the street and leave for the trash man. This was <laughs> days of daily trash delivery yeah. and more dirt and up until finally there was enough space that a student could raise their hand and not touch the ceiling. So <laughs> wow. it, was, it was a small space. It was a small wow. space. Interesting. How, big, how many meters or feet would you say the space was? Oh, that's it. I'll tell you what, this is a great question to ask Lenny Pitt. Yeah. Because yeah. he'll he'll hop up and mark it off for you. <laughs> so on one end, there was a an electric heater that was supposed to heat up the space, didn't do a very good job. There were these little windows at the top of the wall so that you could see Anybody walking by, you could see ankles or feet. Um, yeah. So that was that kind of, you had this feeling of being uh, quite separated. Uh, he, Crew joked a lot about this. He said, ah, never forget, uh, dear students, that the first Christians were also uh, meeting in the catacombs. And, <laughs> 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 uh, 
So, and what was the spirit? It could be anything. The spirit of the past could be jovial. It could be depressed. It could be melancholic. What uh, was that? What was the sense in the room when he would? Was he in the space when you were there before you, or did he enter like an entrance? He was waiting at the bottom of the steps, and he had over his arm uh, ropes. And there were green ropes for the beginners, uh, for the ancien élève. Uh, I don't know if no, it must, they must have been raw rope, sort of a brown, brownish tan color uh, for the beginners. Then for the sort of intermediate students, they were green, and for the teachers or assistants. At that time, there were gold ropes. I still have my gold rope. So these are these are literally small woven rope-like strings. Yeah, rope. yeah. yeah. Uh, and the first exercise was done with that rope. So he would hand, and he would have certain things that he would say, and you would respond according to how he said. But it was basically, hello, how are you? And you would say, very well, thank you very much. And he would take give you the cord, and you would take the chord and a whole sort of singing back and forth uh, yeah. that happened. Then the first exercise started with the class. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> so the first exercise was to make you into the prow of the ship. Mm -hmm. This wonderful forward energy mm. coming out. Uh, mm. So, and then he would tell jokes, he would sing, always singing. Uh, if you remember singing in my class, yeah. I can't I can't teach without singing. Mm. When I started uh, teaching for the crew, with the crew, uh, uh, I had this interesting event that that about singing that occurred. Uh, the first day that I taught, uh, I went upstairs afterward and the crew was in the kitchen uh, and said, how did it go? How did it go? I said, it was, well, it was okay. It was okay. Of course, it had been terrible. Uh, <laughs> the second day, same thing. He was there to sort of encourage him. Uh, and the third day, I finally was able to relax enough and that I was able to sing the exercises. And when I got to the top of the steps on the third day, he said, hey, hey we, and how, how was it? How was it today? And I said, I was good. He said, I could tell you were singing. Ah. So enchanté, singing within the vibrato that goes out into the space and captures the very last person at the, at the end of the at the end. That's, that's very beautiful, Tom. That is that's yeah, a yeah. beautiful idea. Of I, I should have arranged this differently. I should have known that I would be hopping up, but that's okay. You can still see it. <laughs> so from here, uh, here, up, out, fingers on the back of the neck, and the hands go, whoa, there I am casting my neck out. Mm. And I come from here, back here, the energy in the sacrum, and draw it forward, draw it forward. <laughs> Throwing it out. And then eventually you can do this. Doesn't have to be large. I can do it. I can do that if I remember. I can do it when I'm sitting here talking to you. The energy comes up, out, out. And Did you ever um, get discouraged? I mean, like, we all know that the technique is very rigid. It's And when I say rigid, I don't mean rigid. I mean, it's, there's a lot of um, discipline involved. Um, there's, there. it's, you know, this sounds so different than what you would have encountered at University of Arkansas, let's say. You know, I'm just saying, did you ever question yourself at some point that you couldn't measure up or what was happening or did what kept you for four years continuing on this journey? That work was so beautiful that, of course, I had moments of depression. I had moments of depression because after the first year, I had the Fulbright grant the first year, mm -hmm. but, the, you know, second, third and fourth years, I was English teaching half the day, working at Ducruz half the day, 
commuting on the subway at least, you know, uh, three hours a day, sometimes four hours a day commuting on the subway. So it's a very complex and very, I lived in a maid's room with a tiny little window and out the window, if you positioned yourself just right, balancing on a chair, you could see the Eiffel Tower somewhere over there. So, uh, of course, we got to, we got depressed. We got you know terrible. But there was nothing. Finally, there was nothing better than the work. And why? Because he had this enthusiasm and love for this work. And for him, it was a sense of discovery every day. Uh, even if you know he had flash a flash of anger or a flash of disappointment or something, uh, his thought you know why can't you do this um, after you know six weeks you still can't do this <laughs> this exercise why can't you you know there was a little bit of all of that there, uh, and then there was the joy in the work. And so you, the, I was going to say how were you promoted? When I say promoted, how were you? allowed to continue into a second year? I mean, what kind of standards had to be met? And then your your transition into an assistant and a translator, how did that come about? Uh, like, just, maybe uh, how did you, what was the the arc of, or the the steps of, um, con, you know, to continue? What, what How did that, they present themselves? You know? It just sort of happened. It just sort of happened. But there, there was no official paper printed that said you do six months of this and then two weeks of that. And no, it was it's all very familial. Mm. And it's very sort of natural way that that was that that evolved. Um, Tom, Tom, I want to ask you a question because of the exposure that I've had to the decrue technique from studying short classes. I, I've just had exposure like classes with you or from Daniel Stein or with Bert Hull or Sophie Wubo and and the the vocabulary is what has been given to me first the whole structure of how you analyze movement which is you know the different parts of the body and how each of those parts move your description now of how you walk into the class and do this beautiful exercise is very different from the decree that was taught to me by the teachers that I was exposed to. And, and most likely because it was a very short, but this system of, of, of um, analyzing the movement is also like an intricate part of his legacy. Can you talk a little bit about that, the vocabulary itself? Well, De Croo himself was such a volcano waiting to yeah. erupt. I mean, he had this tremendous energy and this tremendous sense of um, carving through the space. Uh, I imagine he did erupt occasionally, too. Would you? Yeah. Oh, well, yes, of course, that too. Yeah. That too. Uh, that he said he needed to teach us a technique uh, so that we would have the possibility to have this that same energy without it killing us. Oh. Mm -hmm. One day in a rehearsal, he looked over at me and I was sort of looking maybe a little tired or disappointed or something at that moment. And he said, ah, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, you know, now this is like plumbing. We're just doing, and plumbing is not very interesting. We're just putting in the pipes. We're doing the soldering. We're doing, making arrangements. It's 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 bore, boring and tiring. And then he looked over. But someday, someday, I promise you, you will have water, hot water, flowing through these pipes. Beautiful. <laughs> he, he's told the same story at other times with electricity. Mm -hmm. He said. Mm -hmm. If I hand you a ball of electricity, it's going to burn you. Mm -hmm. If we make carefully make some uh, circuits, some circuit breakers, some fuses, we construct a system, and then we let it flow. Then we let it flow. So he likes to do this. I can do this gesture here. The, you see the edges. You always saw the edges, but you also got the idea but it was the way he taught it. Now, I know there are some teachers who teach the energy first and then teach the geometry, and some people teach the geometry first and then teach. It doesn't matter. It, you have to do it all sooner or later. Mm -hmm. so. But the, the, the analysis of the movement is very fascinating to me, and it's different from learning dance where you're 
and and dance you're you're learning a way to move but in the decru technique you're learning like all the possibilities of movements like all this sort of like there's like like you start thinking and analyzing the way that you're moving in everyday life and you start to observe more deeply how movements and what the movements mean and and how the slight difference in a movement can mean something totally different um that to me is is a very fascinating part of the technique itself. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just like language is exactly the same thing. <clears throat> if you put an emphasis on the first word of, or the first syllable of the first word <laughs> of the sentence, or where if you put it somewhere else, you put the accent somewhere else, you put the quality, it completely changes the meaning of what it is you're saying. So, mm -hmm. so Ducru was a great. This is ironic in Espa that somebody that Ducru spent a, a lifetime um, working on silent, silent art was so influenced by speech, by diction. Uh, mm -hmm. by the exact meaning of words, the origin of words, all of that was was part of the picture. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about De Croo himself, and I think it's we're time it's time to talk a little bit more about you, perhaps, Tom. <laughs> um, but I think the last in the last analysis, maybe you could speak to because you did return to the USA and you um, have this long, long career you know, imparting this knowledge to others. But what, in the last analysis with De Cruz's work, what do you think the the resonance is? Like, why why would someone still be interested today um, in 2023, you know, as opposed to 1970 or, you know, 1975, 1965? What, what is the resonance, do you think? of this technique because you know it's it's still rever revered and saluted to this day well you know or what are the com what's the complexity of continuing that that legacy you know in yeah. today's world so, it's very complicated <laughs> yeah four, four years of study daily uh for a, a technique like the cruise technique even then seemed like a long time for some people for me, it was just right. Four years was just right. But for some people, four years was Im an impossible thought. Nowadays, the speed, things have sped up to such a point that if a person can do a two-week workshop without having to fly off to Atlanta for a grandmother's funeral or the things that people, you know, uh, two weeks is a, is a huge workshop these days. Mm, so, that's right. uh, and it's going to take longer to do this this particular technique, but the traditional forms are that way. Uh, if you go to India and you want to study any of that traditional classical music, Indian classical music, any of those classic dance forms, um, if you want to study the almost any in Japan, I mean it's it's a lifetime. It's a lifetime of learning in Japan. Do you feel um, this word classic is a stumper sometimes? You know, I like to use the word neoclassic. You know, the past informs the, the present, which in, informs the future, which is actually informed by the past, which, you know, we couldn't have the future without the past, blah, blah, blah. You can get into all these esoteric metaphysical thought, correct? But um, this word classic, what, what what's your feeling yourself about that in itself, like, where does that fit, you know, for, uh, you know, I know a lot of younger generations might have misgivings about the word classic, you know, how, yeah, how, can, yeah. we, how can we describe, well, you wouldn't be here without that, and it, and the future won't be here without blah, 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 you know? Yeah, I, I don't really know what even what to call corporeal mime. Uh -huh. uh, there, there was a, a critic once who, who wrote about it a show that I was doing with a group of students. And he said very perspicaciously, he said, how, how can there be incorporeal mime? So <laughs> in other words, isn't all mime corporeal mime? And he's right, all mime is corporeal mime. Uh, yeah, so what we call it, I don't know what we call it. I think the crew technique is a good thing to call it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but then it's going to be so richly flavored by every person who, different person who studied. Mm -hmm. So I, I have different ways to to go at the cruise work, and and it looks, I'm sure, it looks different than some of my colleagues. Well, let's just yeah, take, I mean, we have let's take for instance that yeah. you're you're working at Pomona College with these theater students, and you've had that position working with theater students and sharing the crew technique with them. What do you feel the importance is for these modern actors to have exposure to that technique and that sort of um, inspired energy and knowledge of the body? You know, for most of the 40 years that I taught at Pomona, my best students were not theater students. Mm. I had students from religious studies who did wonderful work. Math students, I had mathematical students who were superb, superb, or even just literature or, or people who were interested. Mm -hmm. So the occasional theater student who was interested, see, they were already 30 years ago, already working on a much tighter timeline. Mm -hmm. So we're walking down the street one day and never having heard of this play. And in four weeks, we have a leading part and we're, we're performing it on the stage. So it's just a different way of working, a speedier mm -hmm. way of working. Mm -hmm. On a bad day, you might say, oh, it's a microwave. <laughs> on a better day, you might say, oh, we have to learn to be concise. We have to learn how to focus our energy. Mm -hmm. So so I think that and Corporeal Mind Master Crew taught it was uh, – there was always room in the class for people who were not movers, people who were not typical body types. We had heavier people, or we had thinner people, or we had taller people, or we had uh, all sorts of people. It wasn't as if there was a type that you had to, or like it, for gymnastics, you have to be a certain. Right. You know, and that was part of part of the work that I admired and and responded to. Quite, quite strongly, I think. Mm. And then you came back to the USA. Were you when you were finished with those four years? Were you expecting to be a performer, or was expecting to be a teacher, or did you find value in both of those? Like my personal belief is, you can't perform without being a good teacher. And part of the mission of an artist is a performer is to be a teacher. That's what art is. It's about communication and handing down the rituals, yeah. correct? So what were you thinking when you returned to the USA after that period of time into crew? And what did you do? I was so thrilled to have a job. I can't tell you. We, uh, Sally and I thought, whoa, this is, they're, they're going to pay us to do this? <laughs> I mean, it, it, really? And of course, if you remember what salaries were like in 19... 72 right yeah they were it was a very small salary but we thought it seemed like a million dollars a year to us yeah i remember my first job offer that was six thousand dollars a year to be a full-time yeah, exactly well, that's... fourteen thousand at then at another school i remember <laughs> where i worked yeah you know like crazy wonderful crazy yeah. so but what they're what they were teaching us to do I realize now what they hired us to do was to be the movement person. There was a voice person. There was a movement person. There was a literature, dramatic literature person, et cetera. And so, and in the larger schools, there were more than that. But in fact, you know, we've got to get the whole body moving, the whole body speaking, the whole body breathing. All of that has to happen in a way that's coherent and makes sense. And uh, how you do that in four years, um, I don't know. So did you feel that the the university teaching was an umbrella? I mean, I know I thought that, that it would allow you to be free as an artist if you could become a professor at some institution. So it yeah. means that the teaching was very important to you, not just performing, but it seems like, you know, one who teaches as long as you have, you know, it finds the beauty and the importance of that action as an artist, you know, that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Artist, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and of course, keeping the balance. So all of this writing that I've done, the editing and writing that I've done, uh, that Sally and I have done, all of this is sort of like one, one more element that uh, 
makes the picture complex and mm -hmm. makes time management very complex. It, so it's, it's important to let everybody know, like, and I have my collection of, of uh, all the mime oh, journals. Oh, look at that. But, yeah, yeah. That you that. have an incredible library of, of, um, things that you have edited that these that have it's a legacy of of writing about mime and and movement that mm -hmm. that's amazing that you james did you say 30 issues of mime journal is that correct tom yeah um, you know i had to round it up i think it's something like 28 or it's it's a lot, and I can't remember. And I couldn't find that that number, so I just rounded it up to thirty. But it's and it's, it's a one of a kind endeavor because there's I don't think there's been anything else like that in the last fifty years, and probably not before that ever in the yeah. history of theater. I mean, as a particular you know genre of theater, you know, mime just, is. You know, many people say mime is the source of theater, and we could talk about that for a long time. But a long time. Why it was quite an ac accomplishment to have this. Uh, why did you stop? I'm wondering. Is this the complexity of life or what? Uh, what? Hold, hold on for just a second. I just yeah. happened to have this with me. I don't know. Can, it, Which this, one is that? This is this is our latest endeavor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. The whole yeah. crew, Irving Craig. And it's just a, a thin little book. As you can see, it's a thin little book. It's available in uh, hardback. Oh. And also... Um, Digital form. Yeah, because you say people... our our endeavor. Who's the other? Who's the it's other? Sally, Sa Sally, Sally, Sally Garfield. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sally uh, your, your wife. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 50, 50, Fifty-one years and wow, coming up. Amazing. Um, uh, uh, Barbara Lee, who did this one on on Capo School, um, was one of our guests. So. Oh, we're, wonderful. We're, uh, you know, I, I haven't listened to those because I, I'm going to listen to them now that I'm sort of on more a master of my own time. You're on the list. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I have time to do that. And so, some of some of the more recent ones are you can access through the website, too. Right. They're like the digital okay. version. Right. Yeah. So right. so this this is not a mind journal. This is actually a, a, a Routledge uh which is a, a kind of a, it's, it's a publishing house and mm -hmm. uh, mostly for for uh, colleges and university people. So well, we, will, we will make sure that there's a link on the website so people can get purchase. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, wonderful, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, exactly. So what I was going to say, though, about the MIME journals is the MIME journals you find on the Internet in Amazon or Aid Books, but it's very expensive. They charge forty dollars for a volume. Sometimes wow. uh, I, I saw one for I don't know if it was six hundred dollars or something like that. I saw one supposedly rare. No, I have them. I have all the back issues. And if <laughs> why, you, why couldn't these be compiled into one volume? It seems like they're a great well, it, of a it, time it, period. You know, yeah, it would be a, quite a thick volume. Yeah, James, it would be kind of like that. So maybe there's. Now, let's, let's have five to a volume. Maybe there's six volumes, five, oh, <laughs> six yeah, times maybe, five. <laughs> yeah, maybe, 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 yeah. But that could be very interesting. I mean, there's a lack of that kind of thing that is very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, oh, I, I do remember... Music. I do remember as a young student when you were first starting out and we were like, oh, there's another issue. It's like a quarterly review of the MIME yeah, journal. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We so excited. We, 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 we very quickly fell off the quarterly review. And onto the occasionally published list. Then, then you got the fatter volumes. <laughs> then we got the fatter volumes. Yes, it was double issues and triple <laughs> issues and all of that. Yeah. It's wonderful. It's really a, a really remarkable accomplishment that you were able to to bring that up, about and and have that as your shall we say your legacy, right? Well, that's one of the advantages of being in a in a university. Oh. They're here. It's that time. Did you get a gift from the Mind Museum? <laughs> Do I open it this, up? Yes. Of this course. Is, this is your, your uh, now, gift. Now, this is the way it arrived at my house with this little torn bit. Mm. And it, somebody was impatient and wanting to get in, but it <laughs> didn't actually get torn all the way. So okay. Maybe they, 
Well, you know, the Mime Museum collects all these, this detritus of all the different mimes throughout the uh, years, and we are deacquisitioning and sending it back to you. So. Oh, the Mime Museum. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. We're, we're on TV, right? That was very, that was very dramatic, that pause. Yes, it was. For people that don't have the video. <laughs> I, I'm trying to figure out what we're, what, um, what does it say on the front? Yeah. Am, am I to re, supposed to read this? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for joining us on the MIME radio show. Please accept this gift from the MIME Museum collection as a token of our thanks. The MIME Museum, Michael Diaz, curator. Souvenir number 64GLMZ. Description. When writing his summary and analysis of Etienne de Cruz's words on mime, and later in 1997, writing a volume called Words on de Cruz, Thomas Lebhart considered and then rejected many words. Several of his students at that time collected the words, thinking he might need them in the future. That's very, very good. I'm glad. I'm glad for that. The word collection ended up in the Mime Museum and are now being returned to Mr. Lebhart. <laughs> and here. Wow. That's only a few of the words. We kept some of them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you see, there's there's a whole word, a world in each one of these words, isn't there? <laughs> Mimeograph, kind of mimesis, mimetic, wonderful. It, it, it kind of ties in with your teacher being so involved with words in his dictionaries too, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, and which dictionary are you using for this? I have no idea. Those are from you, Tom. Those aren't from us. Your students collected all of those words, you know, and gave them to us. <laughs> I, no, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm going to study this, and I'm very grateful. This is a wonderful uh, something to ponder. <laughs> of course, for sure. That's why I said that was your uh, your uh, approach, you know, earlier. That let's wait, you know, twenty four minutes or twenty four hours. You don't yes. have to talk about it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> what, uh, hey, Tom? What? Um, so we're all getting older. What? How do you perceive the aging performer's body? How do we adapt? Like, when, do you still perform or uh, or when was the last time you performed? You know, I think it's impossible to teach without performing and perform without teaching. Right, so right. The last time I performed was a week ago today. Ah. And you're still teaching, correct. So that, and a good class is like a performance. So what's what's the key to um, to an artist continuing their work with a healthy body and a, a healthy mind? Like, what are the tricks or the approaches one might use as a artist ages gosh i'm a great believer in naps yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah uh de Croo was a great believer in naps de no, said, was he, how old was he when when you were working with him how old would he have been at that time he was in his 70s yeah oh my oh my goodness okay. yeah 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 both both avner and michelle matlock talk about naps the, as yeah. a as a way to to survive a, a performance uh, ritual, yeah, there you go. Mm. But one has to adapt, don't they? I mean, does the, the, the crew technique allow for adaptation, or do you find that some moves are more difficult, or how do you find the spirit of the move or the core of the move, which is not compromised? You just try, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I can't think of any any response to you. Uh, yeah, I, just I show up and things will happen. You got to show up. <laughs> show up and things will happen. I, I, I'd love, of course, I, I used to do, oh, it was insane, you know, like 35 minutes of, of uh, you know, straight out movement with no pause or more, 45 minutes more, an hour mm -hmm. of movement with the, some of the solo pieces. Now I like to do lecture demos. And I like to uh, just start with quotidian movement, ordinary movement, and just the most ordinary things and see where they go. 
Where, mm -hmm. where do we go from here with these movements? Mm -hmm. So that, that seems like it might be part of the cruise method too, right? That you, I mean, yeah. you were talking earlier about this journey, like you find the, the spark and then you see where it goes, you know? Yeah. Even sounded like some of the classes were in that approach, you know, like where yeah. are you going with this? Yeah. It, should a performer keep, uh, keep going or do you think there's a time when you have to stop? What, what's your feeling about that? I mean, in one sense, we're lucky because, you know, if you take a professional athlete, they stop at some point, right? But an yeah. artist, a movement artist, what 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 drives us? What keeps us going, do you think? Should we keep going? Yeah, I think it's a case by case. I think this is, I, I think that's the answer. It's a case by case because I think with each person, it's quite different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh I think naps are good, probably chamomile tea. You know, we could make a whole list of sort of <laughs> new age or health food or whatever kind of things or vitamin E. I mean, I don't know. But, it, it seems like you take a you take a lot of walks with your oh, wife. Oh, I love to walk. I and love you travel walk. a lot. I mean, it seems like your mind is still very much in the, has a sense of movement about it, you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more and more that I can't really continue – uh, burning up jet fuel mm. uh, at the rate that I have for the last 50 years. I think I have to to stop that because I think that I do care about the environment and I do care about clean air. And the fact that I live in one of the most polluted uh, cities in the world uh, does not mean that I that I need to just go on doing that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that Without thinking. That sort of makes me, um, I have one question that I was really interested in talking to you about, and that's about social commentary um, or, or um, using the arts for, for cultural or political criticism. And I know that that's a, has been a part of your work, that, that, you, that there are things that concern you in the world, as you just said, that you want to use your art to explore or to talk about. So... What talk a little bit about that aspect of your um, work? Well, for the first ten years after leaving De Crew, I did all of these like mini De Crew attempts of things. I would perform the Carpenter and the Washerwoman, which he taught to me, as and keeping it as at a, as strong a level as. Can as you explain possible. just briefly what that means? Because for those people who don't know what the Carpenter or the Washerwoman, what that means, can you? Describe briefly what that is. Those are two solo pieces that De Croo first made in his very first experimentations with corporeal mime, but then sort of codified into, into uh, little polished gems in the 1930s and then taught to certain students over the years. So you had to be selected to carry on the tradition. In other words, right. you, would, you, know, right. you had to have permission, I guess. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then he made always with his students because there was nowhere else he could get actors. He couldn't advertise in the in the newspaper and say, you know, we need uh, four people trained in Etienne de Cruz technique because there weren't four people trained. Uh, he had to start with students and train them. And, and that's what we've all had to do because we can't just start making work. You have to train the elements first. And then with those elements, you make the work. So... so so first you were performing De Cruz pieces, but then... And, and then I was trying to make some things of my own, but in the De Cruz style. So yes. I did I did that for 10 years and it was spectacularly disastrous. It was... Uh, uh, people really didn't get it and it wasn't a performance really. Uh, when I came to uh, uh, Pomona, I began to have ideas about how storytelling could be combined, verbal storytelling could be combined with some of the movement studies that I had been working on. And so I put together a play called How I Was Perplexed and What I Did About It. Mm -hmm. And it had a lot of things about uh, things that are social uh, things in, involved in the making of the play, environmental and so on. Um, and I remember performing it uh, for the first time at a little theater in Los Angeles called the Wall and Boyd Theater. It was on the corner of Wall and Boyd. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, it was right in the middle of uh, these tents of homeless people. Still, after 30 years, there's still homeless people around Wall and Boyd. And suddenly, audiences were responding to my stories. Mm -hmm. And they were understanding the movement in ways that I didn't understand it sometimes. They, mm -hmm. they were, there's this idea of there being a text on one track and movement on another track. And the movement does not illustrate the text. Mm -hmm. If I say, I love you, it's kind of um, unnecessary. I can either do it or say it, but to combine the two is extraneous. So I had stories about my growing up, stories about my first jobs, stories about uh, living in the segregated South of Florida. Lots of interesting, what I found to be interesting stories. And then this, quote, pure movement studies, which were open enough that somehow the audience was able to put together mm -hmm. and make their own connection. And mm -hmm. so I've come to think of audience participation as the audience, somehow there being sparks that would jump from one side, one track to the other track, mm -hmm. and a new meaning would emerge. It was greater than the sum of the parts. Uh -huh. yeah. um, now you've had companies over the years. Yeah. These, these groups, for, for example, when you and I were in those festivals in Mexico, I know you had a group from, I think you were, I can't remember where you were headquartered, but. That was Grand Rapids. Yeah. Would those groups have been doing decrue manifestations or would you be approaching something more connected to the social fabric of where you were coming from yeah no those those were the the mixed uh, the the, the decrue attempts we'll call them mm. that was in the 10 10 years that you saw and you would have seen very clean very precise very clearly choreographed obviously committed work uh which i have on video now in which i'm getting together some archives Oh, wonderful. archives right. so they're visible oh and on my website if you if you look there's a little section on my website that says video and there there are some videos of performing uh with a chair and performing with the table yes. and yes. various things just pure movement it's just prior to the folding in of the text which uh -huh. is the next step uh -huh. um, so, and where's the work evolved to now? You said a, a week and a half ago you had done a performance. Where? Oh, yeah. Where I was. Were... I was in a sense worried about that because I'm glad you came back to it because I said that performing is teaching and teaching is performance. And since I taught my video, my Zoom class, it was a performance. Yes, it was of a, of a kind. Yeah, and yeah, so, yeah. So it wasn't. A, Performance as you maybe as you're thinking. I understand what you mean. Yeah. 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 But but Tom, you know what? You did come around to answering our very first question, which was about the who you think of as the audience, because you were just telling us, you know, you have the text, the stories, and you have the pure movement, and the audience is the one that's bringing it together. So your yeah. your collaboration, you think of your audience as collaborators in that sense. Maybe. I love that. I love that. Yeah, that's great. I have a question. So you and I have both have spent many years in uh, teaching in a university or a college. And how do you feel the university or, or a college is set up today to 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 offer what an artist needs to to learn an art? I mean, I have misgivings about the structure today. I mean, you know, there's less face time. There's, you know, financial challenges and so forth. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about where the training of a young artist is moving, is it moving? Is it moving away from a university into private studios, which have always been there but have not necessarily been at the forefront? But what do you think about what's happened in universities, and what the future holds for a young artist? You know, I just training? it's so such a rich and complex um, question. Yeah, it's again, I'm going to have to say it's one by one. There are students who can who can profit from the experience of an undergraduate or even a graduate MFA program and find work or make work 
I'm thinking now of uh, Zoot. I'm I'm blocking on a on a, a name, but it'll come. Or you'll you'll remember yeah. tomorrow. Yeah, so keep, yeah. Keep I'll remember. Moving. I'll remember tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I, let me just say I can make it gen more general. I mean, uh, here it is. The name came in, of course. Aaron Christopher, who was one of my first students at Pomona College in the 1980s. She left undergraduate school, BA in theater, and went to work with uh, Goat Island in, uh, in Chicago. Isn't, mm -hmm. isn't it called Goat Island? Yes, that's right. Uh -huh. Uh, she worked with Goat Island for a long time, touring back and forth in the UK and in the USA. And then I guess Goat Island dissolved, or yeah. mm -hmm. and Karen is now all the time in um, the UK, married to a Scotsman. There's a person who found a pathway into performance art, and it's like, I don't know, what is the percentage of people who can earn their living with performance art? I don't know. It's so frightening. We don't want to know. It's 0. 0.000 something. You know, it's really small, small. So, but somehow students, if they were theater majors or if they were MFAs, they think that they're ready now to be performers. And I don't know that that's always true. I don't know that uh, it's such a weird combination. Yeah, in a sense, it's just one little drop in the in the bucket for the process of learning to be an artist, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. But then on so the maybe, other... maybe being in a university never was important, you know, maybe this overall body of experience is what's most important. But on, on the other hand, Tom, there's what you said earlier, where you were saying that some of your best students were not the theater students. They were the people that were coming from other departments that, that were attracted to this work. And I'm sure that, whatever they got out of the class they took into their studies to be a doctor or or a or a math teacher or whatever they pursued true yes yes we we hope that's true yeah 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 <laughs> did you ever have uh were you ever frustrated with the the university system or the college experience were you ever or doubted yourself that you should be out there? Or was that, you know, the richness, you know, on the other side is the richness of that environment, which is, if you're open to it, it is nothing like it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you've answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's exactly it. I, I agree with you 100%. I'm doing my own therapy there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. well, it's cheaper. <laughs> So, 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 Tom, you were talking a little bit about um, working on uh, your getting some videos ready to be seen, and and uh, your website. Your you have this incredible collection of writing. What do you think of your legacy? Do you have a, a an idea of like what you want, how you want to be thought of, of what you leave behind? Oh, I always found those questions rather grim. Yeah, <laughs> they could be. I didn't mean it that way, though. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I I know. I I know the intention is always uh, is always very good. Uh, I think that first of all, who who can be aware of of what they what what did a person intend in the first place? So you could have either met the mark or missed the mark. I, I think I have to uh, check back in twenty four hours. <laughs> <laughs> What advice would you give to a younger artist right now that's interested in the crew work or physical theater or theater itself? Or you know, where would you point them? If some 16-year-old, 17, 18-year-old came up to you and asked that question, what would you say? Uh, we have a lot of students who get uh, Watson grants. I'm sure you know about the, the Watson grant for... Uh, post undergraduate work and you get a year, a paid year. Uh, I forget exactly how much they give you, but a comfortable amount. And you can travel anywhere in the world you want to pursue any dream, any thought, any education that you want. So we've had, you know, five or six over the last 10, 15 years, five or six for, for, from theater. Mm. So young people who have gone to to Bali, to South America, to, you know, theater groups, to apprentice for a couple of months with them, to, to taste, to see the larger sphere. And um, 
what are people going to do? I mean, people have, uh, we were just talking about a, a student, uh, Sally and I were just talking about a student who <clears throat> had a very serious China and, and a marriage and a child and back into the USA and a very interesting variegated path that no one could ever ever foresee the kinds of pathways different pathways what would be the um the future of corporeal mime or or physical theater i mean you know the word mime has is a dirty word to some people or very misunderstood the word clown has been that way um what 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 does the field need now in this this time the 21st century what what I mean, I know back in the day we had a lot of festivals. <clears throat> we had um, there, there was even a network TV show by Shields and Arnell, right? So, what is it even necessary for physical theater to be on a more public platform? Will it always be a very mysterious ritual for people who know they want to do it? You know, it, it, maybe that's all that's important, or should it be more public? Or what? What, what do you feel about the future of Theater. You know, physical theater is coming into its own along with devised theater, uh, co-created theater. That's a silly theater. word, isn't it? Because wasn't it always that way? Yeah, <laughs> Even yeah. Shakespeare, this is just my field, even Shakespeare was devised theater at one point, you know? Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but, but we're much more aware of it now, I think, in the last few years, we've become much uh -huh. more So that's a good thing, you would say. <laughs> yes, yeah. And so I think that a Czech friend of mine said, all history is synthesis, analysis, synthesis, analysis. So de Croo is a person of great synthesis, uh, of great analysis. And, you know, head from the neck, head and neck from the chest, head, neck, chest, et cetera. Analyze bit, 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 bit by bit, by bit, by bit. And eventually, people absorb this work and into performance and it becomes an anal a, a synthesis mm -hmm. of this analysis and that analysis and so on. And it just keeps going that way, I guess, in history or according to this view of history, keeps going that way. So I don't know. Um, I, I think it's a great question. I thank you for posing it. <laughs> <laughs> You're a, you're a true uh, vessel of energy. <laughs> yes. yes. We're wow. really delighted that you are part of this um, Mime Radio Show, Tom. Your, your stories are wonderful, and, and yeah. all the things that you have brought to the mime world have been fantastic. So, What's about, uh, what, uh, in all your, your travels, where's one of the most uh, stimulating places you've traveled to where you performed or taught? Like what uh, has has mag magnified itself in your brain as from that experience? Uh, I like Wrocław uh, uh, in Poland very much. Mm. It's the Grotowski Center is there. And why is that? Uh, uh, because I was such an an admirer of Grotowski's work, mm -hmm. and because I saw him perform that work in 1976. Mm in Poland. And then I went back 20 years later and performed in that same spot where I saw him perform. Ah. So that was a very important moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of there being a good place for, I, I, I guess I'm feeling kind of above the fray. I don't know. I think that there, there are times that I would have advocated for, oh, yes, you know, only the French know how to see, or the Italians, or have you seen uh, Pipi del Bono? Have you seen the Italian uh, clown, yeah. Pipi del Bono? And, and you know, look, look at that it's wonderful Italian energy and so on. No, I think it's all good. I think it's all good. I love Japan. We love Kyoto. Mm. Um, we love Claremont. We have a beautiful garden behind our house. I can see it. I'm looking right out into the, and the beautiful golden shafts of light are coming down. Mm. And there'll be a long sort of uh, twilight. Tonight. So this, 
this leaves one question like tom what do you want to be when you grow up you know i think we're gonna to have to put that on <laughs> on the list but you know I'm so, I'm so thrilled that you guys have invited me and i'm really touched deeply touched that you thought to include me in this uh really interesting and uh which feels to me right for the moment i think that people are in this do you know i thought today we couldn't have had this moment if we hadn't had covid it's mm. true we, who would have thought of this? And I love teaching on the internet. I and I, I'm not going to take, as I said, as, as many planes anymore. I'm going to I'm going to teach everything I know, heart and soul, on the internet. Embrace the enemy. Mm -hmm. yes, <laughs> yes. Well, yes. this is our this is our silver lining of a, yeah. of a terrible terrible tragedy to the world, but that we did figure out this way to stay connected when we were all um, quarantined and, and had to stay apart from each other. And that's exactly what happened. This, this podcast came about because of that. So yeah. And, and so, so maybe, maybe there is a kind of a follow up to the podcast where you can do like uh, two weeks with James Donlin, or you can do uh, three or four weekends with uh with Karen Hoyer, the, the, all of these different things that well, there's lots of possibilities here. I mean, it's uh, as you know that in, in back in 30, 40 years ago, these 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 events where people would come together were very important for our development and for our knowledge. But now we have something like Zoom, where I think you're you're speaking about something very interesting. You know how modern technology can can you know communicate. Like we like we did in the past, you know. That's very interesting. Yeah. And and Mar uh, Mark, when we talked to Marguerite Matthews, she was the one that was saying, "Did you know that Tom is teaching on online?" And I was like, "Tom Levert, it's online. That's amazing. That's a, um, but it's a wonderful thing. It's it is. Well, let's keep thing. let's keep it up. Let's keep yeah, it. Yeah. Up. We're gonna yeah, put yeah. you on the list. We're gonna invite you. Oh, yeah, good, yeah. good. We'll, we'll do something and we'll invite you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, Tom. This has been a uh, very rich time spent with you, and I'm I'm happy that you're here and that you're continuing the work. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you for listening to the Mime Radio Show podcast. Be sure to join in the last Monday of May for the next episode of season four, and be sure to like and subscribe.